Hi, welcome to Rainbow Space Magic Con 3.0. This panel has something to do with writing series, science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction, essentially long form stuff. Let's start with um, Antonia, tell us uh, your name, your genre, the type of series you create, whether it's like limited books, infinite books, continuous series, or just same world, different characters, that kind of stuff. Hi, um, I'm Antonia Aquilanti. Um, I write uh, fantasy romance. Um, so currently I have two series published. Um, one of them is a, there are different types. So one of them was a continuous um, two books, um, continuous story, probably finished though I never finished with anything so it's entirely possible I'll go back to that world at some point and write something else um the other one is an ongoing um shared world series so not a continuous story um characters world stuff kind of carries through but um new story new romance in every book um it's currently eight books I will probably go maybe at least to 12. We'll see what happens. Um, like I said, I think I'm incapable of just write. I'm certainly incapable of writing a standalone, apparently. Okay. I've tried. Doesn't seem to work. Um, so <laughs> that's um, but that's me. All right. Uh Steve. Hi, yeah, I'm Steve Turnbull. I write mostly action adventure in three separate universes. Um, I've written most books in a steampunk universe, but they don't sell fantastically well, but then I'm not promoting them much. Um, I've written one major book in a science fiction universe, uh, near future dystopia, but unfortunately the world has been catching up on it, so that's kind of, I might not do any more of that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, but what I work on mostly is fantasy. Um, so, are are your series are they continuous like same characters? Every, well, those ones are all one set of characters, and those are all another set of characters. The one at the bottom is this is a steampunk series which goes all the way down there. Um, that those two are also steampunk, but they're erotica and they're not action adventure per se. Um, and I'm currently writing these ones up here. Um, yeah, so uh, no, I'm the same as Antonia. I, I can't write standalones. It's impossible. I start and they just keep, the worlds just keep getting bigger and everything. Um, yeah, and I also get crossovers. I mean, there's a lot more in the steampunk than the ones there. But I get the characters cross over in those ones, and the characters in these books appear in those books. And there's a character in these books that appears in that book. And we're in the, yeah, exactly. So that, that's me. So yeah. a little bit of commonality in the world, but not necessarily necessary. No. Um, yeah, I mean, the current series is 350 years after the previous two series, but there is still a character that's in both. Okay. Uh, Jessica. I am Jessica Lucci. I live outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm also a steampunk writer like Steve, and I also write poetry. Now, my steampunk, I do have a series called the Watch City Trilogy, but I missed my characters so much that I wrote a novella featuring a couple of the characters just because once I left that world, I felt so empty and I dreamed about my characters and I needed them back in my life. So, and so since the trilogy, I've written a lot of short stories, some which are steampunk, some which are sci-fi. Um, I have a whole collection of short stories which are just queer sci-fi steampunk. And I'm really proud of it because I feel like all my, all my books are queer anyway, but um. So that's what I do. All right. Um, and my name is Valerie Michaels, and I write space operas and science fiction. And um, I have 
a nine book series. I just released the ninth book this year. And then I circled back to book one. So I'm about to release a second edition of the first book um, due to things that I learned because it was my very first book ever. Um, and then, um, and then I just started a military science fiction series and I released the second book this month for that. And then, um, and then I have two other standalones. One's a, a dystopian world, like apocalyptic dystopian world. And that one, um, um, and then I have another one, it's a young adult space opera. And both of them have serious potential, but because they had very weak launches, there hasn't been motivation for me to write more in those series. But, um, but I do have several books outlined for them if uh, time and money ever align. So uh, that's what I write. And yeah, so I, I kind of got the sense that um, that there's an answer to this first question that is no. But the first question I want to ask is, are you a plotter or a pantser in terms of a series? Do you plan all the books or do you do it, take it one book at a time and then um, just keep adding to it? And have you tried different methods for different series? And um, is one starting to work better for you now that you're practiced at it? Or do you, you know, what do you do? Um, so I'll start with Jessica with that one. So I brought props. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I anticipated that question. So when I was first writing the Watch City trilogy, I didn't intend for it to be a trilogy. But then I got three quarters of the way through my first rough draft. And I'm like, this is going to be a trilogy. So I have these poster boards. I'm definitely a plotter. <laughs> I write everything down in outline form, which I go back to and change multiple times and add to and subtract from. But this is my basic, oh, it's upside down. This is my basic plotting board. I start off with blue, which are just ideas, and I have them separated. They're numbered one through 20. And so one is beginning of the book, and then each line here will, will begin like a new exciting part, a new problem, and then they have to solve it. And then there's another problem and they have to solve it. So by the end, all the problems are solved, except for my trilogy, there was one problem that wasn't solved. So plus book two. <laughs> so I definitely am a plotter. Um, I also use these sticky notes. I have bunches of them. I'm very rainbowrific. And they help me with my plotting. Like as I go through my uh, outline, I'll write down um, purple is stasis, which is a calm scene. Like um, my character is sipping tea on a train. Nothing's really happening. Then we have pink trigger. It's a scene that sparks a result. In my book, the train crashed. Then there's green, which is the quest in which in Watch City, uh, Waltham Watch, she was put, she had to postpone her journey because of the train crash. Then there is blue, which is Bolt, which is a setback to the plan. So she, she was stuck in, the, in Waltham. She's trying to get out, but then she develops a crush on somebody and decides to stick around a little bit longer to see where that goes. And then there's yellow, which is a shift which the character experiences an internal change. And that's when she started to see the people of Waltham as individuals and not just people to pass by and decided to help them out in their problem. So, so that's Were you that plotting goes. the whole three books together so or were you just focused on the first one and then leaving threads so that when you approach the second one, you kind of have a thread, but not a clear... Way to go. So I, when I had the first one, my I had in my office, I had this hung up for the first book and it was all full of all these sticky notes. And then when I decided to write the second one, um, when I got like a third of the way through, I'm like, all right, this is gonna be a trilogy. So I, at one point I had three poster boards up in my office with all different sticky notes of ideas and things I wanted to put in the next book. So 
by the time I finished book one and published it, I already had sticky notes on book two to start doing my real outlining. And um, then book three just happened pretty much quickly after that. <laughs> yeah, just kind of fell out. Yeah. So, all right, Antonia, do you wanna uh, share your process? Sure. Um, I am sort of the opposite. I am not much of a plotter, actually, <laughs> which um, can get you into trouble when writing a series, I will absolutely admit. Um, but I tend to be more on the pantser side of things. I plan, I just don't outline, I don't know everything that's going to happen. Um, so, you know, my, I did try once the, <laughs> the two book series I did try because I had both books in mind. I was going to it was actually a um, little challenge to myself. I was like, I want to write something that is just a contained, continuous series, two books long, this is it. So I attempted to do more plotting. I still didn't plot quite the way a plotter would. Um, I wasn't really outlining. I did probably do a lot more um, note-taking world building and really trying to figure out what was going to happen as I went, just because I knew I had these two books I wanted to write. Otherwise, yeah, no. Um, I When I wrote um, the first book in my Chronicles of Tornai series, um, The Princess Consort, when I was writing it, I was I had an idea of where I was going. I didn't really, I was kind of world building as I went. Um, I really thought it was going to be a standalone book. By the time I was about halfway through my first draft, I figured it was going to be three books because I had two more couples I had to deal with. Um, and it's now eight books. So <laughs> um, for me, yeah, I tend to be, I don't know if I call it being a pantser or being kind of more organic about things, like things just tend to grow. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the I, world I call it discovery writing, where like you discover the next thread and then you just follow it. Yep, that's a. I think that's a nice way of saying it. Yeah, and then these threads kind of branch off, and I end up with, oh, I need to do this, and here's this character, and oh, he's gonna end up with him, or she's gonna end up with her, or whatever, and it's, and it all just grows, and so the world grows, which is really nice and fun. Um, until you maybe hit something and you're like, oh yeah, maybe I should have thought about that earlier, but you couldn't have thought about it earlier because you're four books later and, you know, but yeah, so I'm very, um, I'm a little different. Yeah. I have that more organic or kind of discovery style. I mean, I do, I try to character build, I try to keep track of things. I have mine or not, it's not post-it notes for me, it's notebooks. Um, so I have bookshelves of notebooks <laughs> that I kind of work on as I go but yeah so for me it's yeah a little bit a little bit more organic as the series kind of develop right. Steve yeah well <clears throat> as we know um you know the, the plotter to pantser it, it's a spectrum and uh I'm very very close to the end on pantser as in I know my main, what my main character is probably like when I start, and I know where I want to go. I don't know anything else. Oh, well, I know the setting because you know, it's whatever I'm writing about. But yeah, that, that, that's it. I don't, I, I don't plan anything <laughs> at all. It just happens. Um, I don't know what to say. I keep all the world building in my head. Yeah. Um, I definitely and... did that with my first series. <laughs> and, uh, then I edited it and I couldn't remember what changed. <laughs> uh, I don't tend to run into any problems. I, I did for my for the first series, which was these steampunk ones, um, but not very much. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't know what to say. That's all right. That's, more that's questions. it. You know, if you're if you're a pantser, you know, you don't have you can't haven't got a clever answer. I can't show you. I can't, I can't bring things to show. 
Um, I've got a map. I, I drew a map after I'd started to go, oh, I need that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, all, all of my all of my planning would come in the second draft after I saw what the first draft did. Is like, okay, this is what happened, and then I would, you know, then I would check the plot uh, and yeah, fix I it there. I, I don't. I only do. I'm, I'm one of these people that only does one draft as well. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's like that's very impressive. Um, what what I write is 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 what. Well, I mean, apart from editing, and it's pretty much what goes out. But then I've had lots of experience. Let's, let's just say that. <laughs> I mean, this book here, which is the first one I wrote back in the 90s, I knew then how it ended there, more or less. Um, and I thought it was going to be a trilogy. Um, but I was, you know, I was just right. I, I actually wrote that and then I wrote all the other, everything else and then I started writing the other three only a couple of years ago um, and then I wrote those and yeah yeah I also I have got to the end, end of book two and went oh no I need another book <laughs> <laughs> so yeah but it did actually end up kind of the way that I imagined it in 1992 so that was all right yeah, I um, I have definitely been a pantser slash discovery writer um, for a very long time, and it started um, like my my series, my nine book series that I just finished. I I was sitting down at work, and there was a picture of North America at night, and I just I was like, okay, somebody's seen that out their window. Oh, they must be on the moon. And then you know the entire series evolved from just me sitting at work staring at a picture um and um and then i figured out who was staring at the moon and what they were doing there and all that other stuff um but then as i kind of mentioned with steve like i i do editing in the second draft so i would plot out everything i did find the threads that i forgot to tie up because um that's kind of the danger of pantsing as you start things and then you don't finish them or you leave them hanging or you don't use them to full fruition. And um, and so that that really has served me well as someone who just loves writing and can do it all day and doesn't find it painful. Um, but then for my more recent books, I actually have been using uh, using a basic outline and that has reduced the number of drafts that I make significantly because I have clearer pacing from the get-go. Um, and then in terms of the series, my my first series, I had ideas for 17 books. I've written nine of them so far. I don't think I'm going to write the rest of them because of the way I structured it um, when it finally came to fruition. But I mean, I was kind of writing them all simultaneously. I had 17 files open. I was dropping scenes into them all um, as they were coming to me. So I knew where the characters were going the entire time. And they evolved pretty significantly from the first book to the last. Um, and then with the with the current stuff, I, my goal was to just create something that can stand alone and if it sells to then create others. And so it's more like, okay, there's a thread that I can pull if it's time to go on. Um, but my Ship Whisperer series, it definitely needs three and it might it might become a fourth book depending on how big that third book villain gets um, because the military sci-fi is hard to wrap up a war in a book <laughs> um, but that that's where i am i'm uh i i'm not quite post-its on a on a note board but i i use a lot of spreadsheets now so um so there's that so I want to jump to a question about the queer characters because we are talking about writing queer series. Um, when you're writing your series, how do you identify them and then how do you keep them fresh after you introduce them in that first book? Like if book one were a coming out story or a surprise, here's the gender identity or sexual identity you don't normally think of, how do you then follow that through with a second or a third book 
to keep it from being repetitive and keep it from being stale. Um, does somebody want to go first? I'll go. Okay, Jessica, thank you for volunteering. You're welcome. So in my trilogy, my um, in the first book, my main character was Tess, but then other another character became so strong during that writing that she became more of the main character in the fall in the rest of the trilogy. But anyway, Tess is bisexual, but in my world, it's a steampunk fantasy, and being gay and queer is not a big deal. Nobody has to come out. It's just one of those things where oh, you're gay or you're not gay or you're queer or you're not queer. It's not a coming out type of world that I created. In fact, all my characters are queer in one way or another. Um, they're all on the rainbow. And, um, but I keep it fresh because I have Tess who's um, bisexual and she uh, uses her relationships to kind of distract her from her problems. So she kind of flits around a little bit <laughs> between people, which keeps it fresh. Um, and then there's my favorite um, character, Martina. She is a part of a power couple. She and Bichelle are complete lesbians. They love each other like crazy, but it's not disgustingly mushy. It's, um, they have such a strong bond and in their relationship, you can see how the relationship grows throughout the trilogy and also how it suffers. So I think by having relationships grow and change, it keeps the it keeps the characters and the gayness fresh and and more interesting. Because if you have a coming out book, how many times can you come out? Unless you're coming out to your family, then you're coming out to your friends and you're coming out to your coworkers. But that's still all one book. And, and it gets repetitive in real life, just like it would in a book. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so by, by altering my character's goals and conflicts within the relationships, it keeps it fresh for me. That's cool. Thank you. Um, and I, audience members, I just want to invite you to put questions in the chat if you would like to direct our conversation. Um, towards questions you have about writing a series. Um, it could be about uh, series writing in general, about science fiction and fantasy and steampunk specifically, and adventure novels. Um, but uh, feel free to ask us questions. And uh, Steve, I'm gonna throw the question to you next. Sure. I was gonna volunteer if you were asking volunteers again. Um, yeah, I actually have a real problem with this question because I, my characters are always diverse in one way or another, usually queer. Um, but they're, you know, how are they identified? Well, by their behavior or not, as in, um, they might, I mean, I have in, in the steampunk series that I've got here, there is a character, secondary character who is a member of India's third gender. Um, but that, although it's known, it doesn't come up. You know, it's, it's not a relevant thing as per se. Um, apart from the fact that she's a maid to the main character who's getting married and her, the person she's getting married to doesn't know. So that, that ends up being quite an interesting reveal. Um, <laughs> he's a bit shocked. I mean, bearing in mind, this is Edwardian period and it's... So. <clears throat> but he, he's okay with it eventually. Um, and in the Dragon series, the main character is Ace Arrow. Now, you know, I'm writing epic fantasy. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a kind of a fake love triangle, as in, if you try hard enough, you could think that it might be one. Um, but it, Obviously it isn't. Now the main character's mentor character, oh, he is, he's not really, but we'll call him that. Um, now he is bi, and that's very obvious right from the get-go. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, but in the fourth book, they have this big conversation. You could call it coming out if you like, because she is trying to understand, because this is a fantasy world. They don't have the words that we have. Um, and I think that's actually really important because I, my books, are tar you know, I don't target the LGBTQ community particularly. Um, my stuff is, I, I consider it to be mainstream, but I think this stuff is really important because it explains to somebody who might not even have thought about these things. Um, you know, um, at least I hope that's what it does. Maybe Being I'm... on a space opera, like slash military sci-fi side, I also like I have issues targeting the queer community because if I go to a queer category on Amazon, it's like 99% romance. And it's like, well, I'm not writing a queer romance. And so I I have to fit in with the mainstream or I don't fit in anywhere. Yeah. So so yeah, I um and it should I be get that as well because it's it's it not the mainstream. center. It's not the center of it's not the center of the plot, but it's still something that um, a reader who's looking for queer characters can latch on to. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so that yeah, I mean, I don't know about keeping it fresh. They just are what they are. <laughs> it's just yeah. Can I just jump in and piggyback off of what you just said about yeah. queer characters and? Um, and Amazon ratings and where you are at and, and that kind of thing. I actually wrote a book of short stories that was all queer characters, but there wasn't romances, so to speak. Some of them were, some of them weren't. But I got a scathing review because they weren't happily ever after romances. And that's what they expected from this book, it being a queer short story book huh. so you're right you, if you are writing queer literature you still have to figure out how you're presenting yourself to the mainstream because the mainstream and the lgbtq community don't always agree on what they're looking for <laughs> yeah and that's one one thing i really like about going to queersci-fi.com is there is that little distinction that you can still be queer but general fiction, um, and you and you don't see that in a lot of library spaces out there. So, um, Antonia, did you want to jump in? Oh, uh, sure. I mean, I'm kind of a little in the because I do write fantasy romance. Like romances, yeah. kind of do um, center in my books. There is that happily ever after. So, um, in some ways, it's a little bit different for me. I mean. I, and it's other world fantasies. So yes, you're looking for different words. You're looking for other explanations. Um, and I do have to do that, but yeah, I mean, you also have ways of showing that with, since you're getting into romances with, you know, who's attracted to who, who's, you know, thinking about past relationships or things like that, that since you're centering a romance, you can maybe do a little bit more I don't know, than in some mainstream books um, or some other genres. So I do kind of have that. I mean, I certainly have to think about other ways of showing things. Like I do have some books with um, characters that are on the asexual spectrum and you need to, you know, like I have, you need to kind of find a way to explain that that isn't, you know, if you have like I have bisexual characters and can talk about different attractions then you have this demisexual character who's like okay you know you've got to put that into words that might be a little bit different than just you know the actions of sort of displaying who someone's attracted to right off um but yeah but it, it at least gives me that you know I, I don't know about keeping things fresh and certainly um you know some of like I said my longer series, each book sort of centers on a different couple, um, though other characters are still there. So you kind of do see evolving and deepening of relationships. Um, in my other series, um, the two book one, The Elemental Magic High, there's a relationship kind of begins in the first book and it's um, 
a bisexual trans man and a um, demisexual cis man. And then that relationship continues into the second book, but there's also another relationship with another couple um, that starts and plays a part there too. So yeah, you get to kind of see, I guess, relationships evolving and you can kind of play with that when you're, you know, doing a lot with romance in addition to your fantasy. <laughs> um, I don't know. So that's sort of, I guess my perspective maybe is a little bit different because yeah, I'm sort of centering that relationship. Yeah, I mean, my my stuff, as I said, is military sci-fi and space opera. I'm not necessarily centered on relationships, but relationships do exist. And so in my new series, I have a non-binary pansexual person and she's attracted to her romantic asexual friend um, who is recently divorced, so he is available, but not interested in her because, you know, knew her through all the stages of figuring out her gender identity as well. Um, so it kind of confused things when they were younger and it didn't really evolve. So in the first book, it like most of her journey in terms of queer identity was, um, you know, like you figured out she was non-binary, you figured out, you know, like she can experience attraction, but it was more um, just like little hints of what it means for him to be romantic, asexual as well and what that meant for their relationship which was um very platonic on his side and her figuring out how to continue like to accept that as a friend it's like i'd rather have you as a friend than like fail at something else um but then in a second book i was able to explore a little bit more of the non-binary side um because um she realizes she learns that she's genetically engineered super soldier and then she also meets um, not her birth mother, but her genetic mother. And there's this line that I absolutely love where the mother's like, you've altered your gender markers, what happened? And, you know, she replies like, you're half spaceship. <laughs> you know, like you have no space to judge um, because there's like this whole blend of person and technology and it. it was just a really funny line to me, but um, like you're half spaceship. What are you talking about? It's like you've altered your gender markers too, <laughs> it's like, or altered more than a gender marker. But um, but just like little things like that, little tidbits to to show it in different ways. Because I don't know about um, I don't know about your personal queer identities, but I figure like I feel like I just keep uh, finding new labels. Of like oh yeah, that matches me too, and it's like. So I'm not just asexual, it's like I'm asexual and aromantic and agender and this and that and the other thing. It's like, okay, and then I fall under this umbrella and this umbrella and then it's like, okay, how many queer identities can I have before it's just like a cookie? You know, it's like, I don't know, or an everything bagel. And everything bagels do not have cinnamon and that's the best topping for a bagel. And that's just crazy. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's besides the point, but, um, but yeah, like as, as we've kind of pointed out, there's a lot of creative ways that we can do it as long as we don't, like we don't have to limit ourselves to a relationship and we don't even have to explore it. We just have to represent, sometimes it's just representation that is going to matter to us. Um, there's a question for us. How do you all manage issues with consistency when writing and editing? I'm super good at planning, but not super good at remembering the details of my planning. And I find that I end up accidentally changing important details every time. Um, for me personally, a lot of that is editing. Um, and you don't always catch everything, which is why you have beta readers and editors. Um, but, uh, but then also I use a lot of spreadsheets as well. So, um, but not for characters. Um, I, I also have gone to those little avatar creation things and I'll create a little avatar of the character so that I remember what I did with their hair and their skin and what outfit they were wearing. So, um, so it kind of creates a, a go-to visual for me, which is kind of cool. Um, Antonia, do you want to talk uh, about consistency? Sure. Um, yeah, for me, it's a lot of, cause yeah, I'm 
I, I am not a huge planner, but, um, for me, it's a lot of tugging back. So yeah, it comes a lot in that editing process when I go through that draft I've written, because I don't, um, I don't edit as I write. I just throw everything on the page. <laughs> I don't even write in order. I just scenes, you know, so once I think I have everything, I put it all together and then I start going through it. And that's when I start really looking for, um, well, one, obviously to make sure I have something coherent, but also to look for those um, inconsistencies. Um, and it goes back to, like I said, I keep everything in notebooks. Um, spreadsheets would probably make my life easier because they'd actually be on my laptop. But for me, it's physical notebooks. Um, and yeah, after a while, it's character descriptions, um, important stuff in setting and world building. Um, and I'm, I just check. I just check as I go and there's a lot of checking. And yeah, um, I hope that, you know, beta readers will catch stuff that maybe I don't. Um, but yeah, it's just a constant, like, you know, okay, I'm just, his eye color is the same, right? I didn't change that. Or, you know, this place looks the same as it did three books ago, right? Um, or even just little things like I, you know, once you've established a magic system in book one, it can't change in book seven. I mean, you can uncover new parts of it to the reader, but the core has to stay the same. So if I've really, if I think I've done something already, I'm going back to check either in those notes or pulling up, you know, whatever book I believe it's in and, you know, doing a lovely little search, like keyword search for where I think it is. Um, if I really don't have it in my notes, um, cause yeah, I, and that's kind of just how I, I root out as many of those inconsistencies as I can. Yeah. I was, um, reading a mystery book and in one scene a detective got beat up and had broken ribs and then two pages later he's walking around with nothing but bruises and I was just like oh God, I hate that did I did I misread that like what's going on and like this is a professionally edited book you know and so I was like okay it is it, it, it does escape some people but um but when I have my characters go into fights, I have to keep injury logs. And then I have to, in the sci-fi world, I establish the timeline for how long it takes to heal. It's like, okay, they have a technology that can heal this in a couple hours. This one takes a couple days. And, you know, because if I had yeah. to wait like months to heal a broken bone, like everybody would die in the first book. It would be crazy. Oh yeah, magic. <laughs> this but, uh, and, yeah, that'll but, help. You know, so, some things slip through. so. Um, write down what you can, but some, like, mm -hmm. nobody's perfect and most people are just looking for a weekend of entertainment and a story. So, you know, get the story. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it'll really, and if you have other people, you know, beta readers or, you know, your editors down the line, like in my other life, I am a copy editor. So I look for that stuff as I'm reading, because that's what you pay us for. <laughs> so you know, other people are going to find things too, like your other readers. So yeah, you're going to do your best. I mean, but yeah, most readers aren't going to be, unless it's huge and glaring and whatever, like most readers are not going to go like, you know, I rate. And, and like, e even in, in that other book, I still love the book. I still gave it like five stars. Cause I like the book, you know, mm -hmm. it's um, Jessica, do, uh, do you want to have uh, uh, Plotter's opinion on that? <laughs> so I definitely am, am a plotter, but also, um, like Lucius just mentioned, I don't always write chronologically. So um, I might just be like really hungry to write a certain scene and I'll write that scene. But the way that I keep it fluent and congruous is my um, my poster board hung up and all around it, I have character sheets for each character. And when I was writing book two, um, there was a scene where I had this one of my uh, one of my characters and it's funny you said eye color because I actually miscolored his eyes and I had to go back and look at the character sheet that I had hung up 
And I'm like, oh yeah, his eyes are not that color. So a little thing like that from one book to another might not be a big deal, but to a certain reader who picks up on that, that would be, that would take them out of the story. And we don't want that as writers. Yeah. So the character sheets and also um, to get an idea and images of my characters, I go to Pinterest and I make um, Pinterest boards of different character looks or different people who inspire me by their clothing, especially since I write steampunk, there's so much out there to look for. And since I have very different settings in my books, like I have a whole world underwater. So I got to go into old Jules, Jules Verne type of universe. And so having those Pinterest boards helps keep me on track too, because I can relate the style and relate the idea of the description of the place, which is as important as maintaining the character. Yeah. Um, the other thing, um, someone in the chat mentioned looking into using spreadsheets is I have a property Bible that has like four tabs. The first one is just the person's first name, last name, nicknames, um, just because sometimes I forget how to spell them. Um, locations, proper nouns, anything that needs to be capitalized, and then just specialized words that I had created. So anything that's not capitalized. And, uh, and that's very valuable in a series, especially if you spend two books and then you go away and circle back to the same place. You're like, okay, what were the names of the characters on this planet? And you have that list there. So, um, and we can talk more about that in Discord. I wanna give Steve a chance to talk before we wrap up. Yeah, I'm just feeling A, inadequate and B, lazy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, you have uh, a method and you have books. So, you know, clearly something's working for you. Yeah, whatever uh, gets the books written. Well, that's true. I, I don't describe characters at all um, beyond what's actually necessary for the plot. So I don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, although they very often end up with short hair. That's happened in every single one of my um, fantasy series. The main characters always end up with short hair one way or another, or no hair at all. Anyway, um, but that's, that also makes it easy. You know, it's, it's great. Um, I, up until the current series I'm writing, I have never written down anything. <laughs> beyond maybe jotting some note down somewhere that I don't look at again ever. Um, but I did have a fantastic continuity editor. Um, she goes by the name of Adrielle Wiggins, who you may or may not have heard of. She was fairly big, sort of. Um, and she, she just has a mind that picks up every single detail and she spots every mistake. Amazing. However, this time, and, and she used to create, she creates spreadsheets, which she would then share with me. So I've got the, I've got her spreadsheets from my previous series, which is handy. And that's fair. how I got my first property Bibles. My first editor gave it to me and he's like, give this to any future editor that you have. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, this time I am copying her spreadsheets. I hate it. So I'll write a couple of chapters and then go back and write down the timeline and what's happened, roughly what's happened and names of characters and where they've appeared. And I, I, I hate that. God, I'm so lazy. I just, I just don't want to do it. I don't but, do it during the, I don't do it during the writing. Yeah. So. Well, you see, that's the other thing. As I said, I'm lazy. I, I write beginning to end linearly once. <laughs> and Yes. Um, oh, well. Um, but yeah, I mean, what was I going to say? I was going to say something. Um, oh, yeah, on the history stuff. But we can get to that later. Um, well, the, the history stuff being what? We have about five minutes left. And it was the so advice, I was thinking of the advice to new readers because I don't have much because of the way I do stuff. <laughs> but I have one thing. <laughs> well, yeah, so my, I, I kind of wanted to wrap up in a minute or less, please. Um, if you have any cautionary 
uh, cautions or words of wisdom for anybody who's embarking on writing a series for the first time um, or um, any any last piece of advice before we close out so I'll start with Steve yeah well the only thing is that you've got to have enough story to fill a series I mean that's fairly obvious really but you know um because padding is the worst thing that's just awful but I was going to put in something which I'm going to pop into the uh, chat, which is the history of queerness for Western civilization is not what most people think it is. I don't know whether you're familiar with the YouTuber Kaz Rowe. Anybody look? No, right, fine. She's great. Um, and she covers the, uh, the history of queerness a lot. And, and I, I think it's useful to know what it, things were like pre-Victorian or even during the Victorian period because it isn't what you think it is um, in all, if you're writing fantasy because not because you have to copy it and do exactly the same thing but just to know the attitudes were completely different and you probably don't know what they are um, anyway so I've, I've done a link there you go yeah, to, you to her in the chat. and then also if you could put that in a discord so that uh, people can come back to that um, Jessica, do you have any parting wisdom? I agree with Steve about the padding. So when I wrote book one in the series, in the trilogy, it wasn't as large as I hoped it would be. So then I thought, do I go back and add some more scenes to it? And I'm like, no, I feel like it's finished. I feel like this is the book. This is the way it's supposed to be. It doesn't need padding. So I left it as it was. So book two is much thicker than book one, but that's because it had more to tell. It needed that space. So my advice would be, I agree with Steve, don't do the padding. Let the story speak for itself. Be proud of what you wrote. Yeah, Antonia? Um, I'm going to say that I think a lot of people um, believe that when you're writing series, you have to be a plotter. You have to strictly plot out everything and where you're going and how many books it's going to be. And, and that's totally fine if that's the way you write. But I think um, so much of writing advice is you must do it this way <laughs> or whatever way that is. And I'm going to say you can do it your way. Like I said, I'm not a plotter. Like I'm not a strict plotter and I write series and I can't seem to do anything else. So you can absolutely do that. What I would say is when you do that, know that you're going to write something at the beginning, three books later or whatever, you're going to be locked into what you wrote at the beginning. That's not a bad thing. It just means you need to keep track of what you did. So find that way of, you know, keeping track of where you were, whether it's post-its or notebooks or a series Bible in spreadsheets or in a Word document or whatever it is, keep track of the important stuff about your world, about your characters. And then, yeah, just go for it. Let it grow, develop, you know, your series. So that would be my advice. Yeah. And in um, similar lines, but um, what, what I've learned is to focus on the book that you're writing um, because you can, you can continue, like, as I said, I was writing 17 scenes for 17 books simultaneously and dropping them in different files. Um, and, and that's fine as well. But when it comes to writing a book, you want to make sure that what you have is a complete unit, that it has a beginning, middle and end. Um, and then I, I ran into this with book five of my series where I spent like the last 10,000 words setting up book six and when I should have ended book five and um, and um, you know cliffhangers are fine if you want to go for a cliffhanger but um, but book five just it, it kind of became bloated because it was trying to also be the introduction to book six and um, you know I'm not gonna change the book it's out there in the world and it is what it is um, and if you read the whole series, it really doesn't matter. But um, but uh, with my new series, I, I started to do that with the end of book one. And my editor's like, no, you don't need this scene here. 
And because I didn't put that scene there, when I started writing book two, I had so many more options for where to begin and how to begin and the mental state of the character because I wasn't trying to pick up the next scene. Um, so when you're writing a series, even if you have ideas and plans for all the future books, um, focus on the one story that you that you, that your goal is to write at that day um, and get the, get that story as tight as possible because that's what's going to keep people reading. All right, we are one minute over. So we have done amazing. Um, thank you to our panelists. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks.